So welcome, Rabbi Berman. It's an honor to have you here. Um, the reason why I've been so interested in hosting your visit here at the Bayit uh, is uh, ever since I read your article, which was about a year, two years ago, on responding to biblical criticism. Um, and you have a very interesting way of reconciling a traditional view of the divine authorship of the Torah with the current uh, uh, documentary hypothesis and sort of demonstrating that um, there is no stira, there is no contradiction, necessarily. Um, and this, of course, has been met with mixed reactions within the scholarly community. Some are with you, some are against you. And um, the first thing I wanted to ask you uh, is, how did you get involved in this? Now, clearly you're an academic, clearly you are drawn towards uh, academic studies. Um, but I can just tell you from myself, I went to university also, I studied Jewish studies in university, but the last thing that I wanted to study was Bible studies because I was petrified. I was petrified that I would discover something or be forced to admit something that could potentially shatter the whole foundation of my faith of Torah min HaShemayim. And so I've avoided it all this time, but you've courageously gone in and you've taken it head on. So tell us a little about yourself and how you got into this uh, discipline. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Rabbi Kravkin, and uh, thank you to the whole community for this very warm welcome on this very snowy uh, Arab Shabbat. Um, um, yeah, uh, the truth is that uh, biblical studies is no place for a good Jewish boy. That's what uh, many think, and uh, there are obviously many challenging issues that, that come up. Um, um, Gosh, my own. So I have to say, it really goes all the way back. I'm not from a, a from home to begin with. My parents were traditional. They gave me a good grounding of yeshiva day school education. Uh, but I came to Torah mitzvot pretty much on my own at the age of 13. This means that for me, the whereas for some people this is very beautiful when they have it, a uh, commitment to Torah mitzvot is simply what they got from their mother's milk. It's the most natural thing for them. And that's great, and that passes on, and that's very strong. Uh, the strength of my commitment to Torah Mitzvot came from a process of adopting it for myself, of figuring out that this is what I wanted to do. So it's very much a part of my spiritual DNA to not run away from questions, that it has to somehow hold together and make sense. That said, I spent many years just do, doing traditional learning, and even when I decided that I wanted to uh, uh, study Tanakh academically. The reason was that I had always had a, a proclivity to Tanakh. I love Tanakh, but it's literary beauty, it's spiritual power. It's a different type of beauty and power than one gets from the world of Shakla Vitarya, Shas, and Poskin. Um, um, and I found that there were tools, mostly literary tools, the type of Torah that people might recognize from the work of people like Menachem Liebtag or David Silver in New York City. Uh, this was the type of thing that I wanted to develop even more. Once I was in university and working in this method, basically the same type of li literary methodology of, of discovering the beauty of the, the text of the Torah, the text of the Tanakh, I'd say about a decade ago, a little bit more, um, pretty much as the internet began to become part of all of our lives in the most pervasive and all-inclusive way, uh, I began to notice that there are many, many people who have a lot of questions. And I recall that I once was part of a forum of the Chanchim, Rabbanim, academics in Israel, uh, all of whom were part of our broader religious Zionist community, to discuss these issues. And I was shocked at how, how many people uh, I was sitting around this table with just, just adopted the whole critical line that this is from the priestly source, and this is the J source and D source. Just, yeah, it's obvious. Well, it's obvious. So now, now what do we do? And I didn't feel that it was all obvious. Uh, I guess I started because intuitively I saw that there's too much integral beauty to the final form of the text, the text, the text as we have it. Things connect too deeply to be able to separate it all out. Uh, and what I wanted to do was kind of explore this issue further. And really what emerges upon investigation is that when scholars, modern scholars, say, oh, well, this doesn't fit. This is a contradiction. Uh, uh, this couldn't have been written by one and the same person. It's too different. That what's really going on is that very often scholars have modern notions of how a, whole, how a text holds together, what is a contradiction. It turns out that these things are not universal, and they always haven't been the same, and that 
what I wanted to do, and this is what most of my academic work has been about in the last five to ten years, has been to look at ancient Near Eastern writings and to see how other writers from other cultures, pagans, Zara, but it doesn't matter when they wrote things, they had a lot of the things that modern scholars say in our Torah are stereotypes or contradictions, and they had no problems putting them in. And then the key is to find out what is it that they were, why did they write things in the way that they did. Now I just have to preface this by saying that implicit in what I'm saying is that the Torah is an ancient Near Eastern document. Uh, that idea has very strong roots in our Masorah. Uh, the Rambam writes many, many times in the Moran Nebuchim that in order to understand many of the mitzvot, particularly having to do with the Avodah and the Beis HaMikdash, sacrifices and things like that, that the key to understanding what a Kodesh Baruch Hu was doing by fashioning uh, a mitzvah this way and that way was is, is rooted in understanding what might have been the mindset, the spiritual mindset, the conceptual mindset of Am Yisrael at the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim, in the world that they were living in, and understanding how the Torah was tweaking each of these ideas to move them forward. The Rambam says, how if I, that I would have more books about the ancient Near East, I would understand the Torah better. And he's not the only one. Ruth Cook writes in a similar, writes similarly that the Torah needs to be understood in its ancient context. The Ralbag, one of our great Mepharshim uh, on uh, Chumash uh, from the Middle Ages, also writes similar things. So I want to, I just want to yeah. um, just press one issue, because yeah. I, I know you're going to be talking about this in Motzei Shabbat when mm -hmm. you talk about uh, Egyptology and some of the archaeological uh, information that we have about the Egyptian exodus, mm -hmm. and you're going to tie that into this whole topic of, of biblical criticism. Um, isn't one of the big issues that we know that there are different, not only different literary styles from different perspectives and stereotypes and contradictions, but every um, ancient era has a different literary style, and we can see superimposed on the Bible multiple different chronological literary styles. How, what, what does one do with that issue? Well, I think that that's true. The Tanakh is, well, we have it as one book, even within our Masorah, this is something that, that, that spans centuries and in many different places. Some of the things are written in Bavel, some things are written in Israel, some of the things are written when we're in power, some when we're not in power. Right, but I'm talking about the Pentateuch, you know, the Hamisha Chum ah, specifically. Chum uh -huh. do, do you feel that they all fit into one epochal literary style? Ah, okay. So I would say, I want to separate out your question, Rabbi, into two. It turns out, from a scholarly perspective, when you look at the Torah and you look at the writings from the ancient world that seem closest, there's many more texts that we know from the late second millennium. That would be the, a period that would roughly fit with um, a traditional uh, dating of Yitziat Mitzrayim and Mahmad Har Sinai, the end of the second millennium, I'm talking about 1300 BCE, 1200 BCE. Texts from that period, there are several that have a strong similarity of style with the Torah, and there are many fewer as we move on in time. Um, that said, the Torah does not need to speak into in one style in order to be a coherent document. Anyone can see this. Sefer Dvarim is, is, is written in first person. It's a very different style, uses very different terms than some of the earlier Svarim do. The, the, the legal sections are different than the narrative sections. But the difference of style itself is not a sign of, 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 of necessary that, 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 that is written by different perspectives or different authors mm -hmm. wow. because, because we see in other ancient writings the same thing. Well, there's a work that perhaps many, many of uh, our viewers and congregants have heard of, the, uh, the Code of, of Hammurabi. Code of Hammurabi, we know, was authorized by this king, Hammurabi, who lived perhaps in the time of Avram Avinu in the 18th century BCE. And it employs several different styles because that was the way people put together compositions then. But the way people wrote once upon a time was very different than today. Today, when I as an author, when any of us as an author, sit down to write, what we must do is to be original. And if you, God forbid, have a style or if you import materials, phrases that are too close to what someone else did, we call that plagiarism. But a long time ago, not just in the ancient world, even in the Middle Ages, even until not too long ago, just the opposite was true. You're going to write, you, you, you view yourself as a significant writer, you must incorporate the great writing of those that have, that, have, that have preceded us. That is the mark of your education and your scholarship. That is the mark that you pay tribute to that, to that, to that Masorah. Even without attribution. Right, that's right. Yeah. Usually without attribution. And so the hallmark of a great work is that it pays it pays tribute 
to other different works and brings them together in an amalgam in what we would kind of see as a kaleidoscope of styles. So, right. So, so the kaleidoscope of styles doesn't, doesn't by itself prove anything about, about whether there's one agent that's responsible for the work in front of us. Right. Now, what I find fascinating uh, is that I look at other um, Orthodox Jewish Bible scholars who have come to a different conclusion, and you are you you feel that there's no tension, there's no conflict because you take a look at literary styles and say multiple literary styles could still be one author, not a stira, not a contradiction. Mm -hmm. There are other Orthodox Jewish Bible scholars who sort of emphatically uh, subscribe to the whole idea of documentary, mm -hmm. it's multiple documents assembled at different times during ancient history, and yet they what's always confused me is that these, I'm thinking about, for, for example, Professor Kugel, he's a devoutly Orthodox Jew, but has somehow managed to reconcile in his mind, I even asked him about that, I couldn't, even, I couldn't understand his answer, um, He's been able to reconcile how he is a Shomer Torah mitzvot, and yet still believes in the documentary hypothesis to one degree or another. And there are others out there as well. There's even a whole website, I think it's called the, the Torah.com or something like that, which sort of uh, takes um, articles that are written by people in our machaneh, but who in somehow are able to juggle this apparent really theological contradiction and say that the Bible can have multiple authors, even the Pentateuch, and yet still feel that this is a binding system of God-given laws that is binding upon every single Jew. And my, and perhaps this is not a question for you to answer, because perhaps you, there is no answer, but I would like to ask if you could just reflect on that and suggest, you know, how do, how do these people reconcile that. I mean, I see your reconciliation is much more uh, easily recognized, but how do you, how do these people make a reconciliation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is true that, that I, and I know not, all the people that you mentioned, I, I know personally, and there are uh, uh, Orthodox Bible scholars, uh, and I should say people who I, I have known, I've seen them in their own practice, are Makhbid, Kalak, and They're very scrupulous in their observance of Torah mitzvot. Um, um, what I hear from many of these scholars is that the world of the intellect and of scholarship and the world of the soul and of devotion to a Kaddish Baruch Hu need to be entirely separated one from the other. Um, I don't know, uh, you'll have to ask them how they do that. I personally am not capable of doing that. I don't see how that holds together. Um, uh, for me, that's a cop out. Uh, if you can't explain it, then it doesn't work. Um, maybe they have explained it. I'm not saying that they don't. I have not heard a cogent explanation of how this gets done. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and I don't want to cast aspersions on uh, any of my uh, esteemed colleagues. I think that at the root of the difference between uh, myself and some of the individuals that you've, that you've mentioned, and I'll say it's not just myself. It may be that within the Orthodox world that I, uh, the, 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 the rather small world of uh, Orthodox uh, uh, Bible scholars, um, I have a lot of colleagues who uh, uh, view issues the way that I do. They are very devout. Uh, they are skeptical of many of the foundational assumptions of the critical scholarship. Um, but they're Christian. Uh, and they're good friends of mine. Great. And that's a great lead-in to what I want to ask you next. Is, yeah. And that is, we all come to the table with an agenda. I, it, okay. Every single human being okay. has, an, has a, yeah. internal biases and yeah. prejudices and agendas. And the goal, I guess, of course, of any purely um, academic scholar who is seeking truth with a capital T is to strip the data of any um, personal agendas and interests. And of course, I'm sure that some of your colleagues who have looked at your work and uh, find it hard to accept would accuse you of having an agenda and engaging engaging in apologetics mm -hmm. in order to reconcile your devout orthodoxy mm -hmm. with uh, Bible scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, and I would assume that many of your Christian colleagues may have had the same accusations lodged at them. Mm -hmm. And so the question really is, and, and by the way, there may be a completely different agenda, an opposite agenda for those Bible scholars mm -hmm. 
who believe that it, there is there are multiple authors and that there is no God who wrote this piece of literature because their agenda may be to escape from whatever religious vices that uh, that's, that w were placed upon them in their youth. Yeah. So the question is, how does one know uh, if I am engaging in apologetics versus really stripping down the raw data into its into the closest thing that I can interpret to be as truth. Right, okay. I would just add that I think that the greatest agenda that many scholars have, not just in Bible and everywhere else, is what have I written in my past that I need to defend professionally? Okay. So if I've written it, then it must be true, because otherwise my whole CV will be chucked into the trash. So I better better, better guard that. I'm not saying that everybody does that. I think it's a, it's a danger in all of academia, not just in Bible scholarship. Um, um, uh, I, I, I think it, there's no getting away that we all have backgrounds and we all have orientations. Um, I find it interesting that in the world of biblical scholarship, probably in the liberal arts generally, if you are a feminist, then your orientation and your agenda are celebrated. Uh, if, you, if you write from the vantage point of disability uh, uh, issues, also then everyone says that's terrific, and it is terrific, it is terrific. I think that the idea that we have to put our identities in a closet and work in a sterile environment doesn't, isn't, it's just not true. It's just not true. I think that, that uh, we have to try to be as true with ourselves as we possibly can. And I think that the, the proof in the pudding is when you're able to come from wherever you are, whether it is that you are an atheist, or whether you are a fundamentalist, or a feminist, or whatever it is you are. Uh, when you come to your reading of the Bible, are you able to demonstrate the, the, your reading from the data in a way that is compelling to people who do not share your orientation? Uh, you might not be able to convince all the people all the time, but if you can convince some of the people some of the time who don't have a kippah on their head, then you know that you're that you're getting somewhere. So if my material has been published in the journals that it's been published in and published by the publishers like Oxford that it's been published in, uh, none of whom's editors or, or, or lectors, the people who read and critiqued the material, or Orthodox Jews, does it make this Torah me Sinai? It doesn't necessarily make it Torah me Sinai. But it means that, 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 that serious people uh, who don't share my orientation or background or interests have said this is worthy of our discussion and attention. Mm. And that's you know you have an exciting uh, catalog of books. Um, uh, your your most recent book I think from 2017 was uh, Inconsistencies in the Bible. Is that it's, yeah? It's called Inconsistency in the Torah. Inconsistency in the Torah. Amongst its laws, amongst its stories. Right. And the subtitle is uh, Ancient Literary Convention and the Limits of Source Criticism. Uh, from Oxford University Press. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I looked it up, tried to find a copy, um, but I would have to take out a mortgage on my home to buy a copy. Right. But what's exciting is that you've just sent a book to the publisher at Magid Press, yes. which is really meant more for the lay, for the lay person, Seabor, for, for Art Seabor, yeah. for the Jewish community. Yeah. And that's going to be coming out soon, and it'll be much it more within the financial... It'll be more accessible on all levels. On all levels, right. Okay. Um, uh, finally, why don't you just give us a glimpse of what you'll be covering over Shabbat. You're going to be speaking multiple times. Yes. Uh, tonight is an Oneg. Uh, tomorrow morning you're giving the Drasha. You're giving the Shi'or Bivrit before Mincha tomorrow afternoon. And then Motzei Shabbat, you're going to do some kind of multimedia presentation. Yes. So please give us a... Uh, okay. Give us a, a All menu. right. Very good. Yeah. Also speaking in five minutes tonight at Davening. Right. Yeah. About an interesting question about our sources about Hanukkah, which we have coming up. Uh, the Oneg tonight is, is titled, uh, uh, Only a Startup Nation Can, can Rebuild the Beis HaMikdash. And those are two things that we are very proud of being a startup nation. We talk a lot about the Beis HaMikdash. We would never think of putting the two in the same sentence. But there's, there's a lot to be said about that, that our Makoros seem to say that this is that the direction we're on in excelling in the areas that Medina Yisrael is excelling in, thank God, are, are really prerequisites for the establishment of the Beis HaMikdash. And I'm going to explain that a little bit uh, this evening. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to be looking at uh, an issue after Davening that I think is a really fascinating uh, trend that we see in uh, the Parsha that we're reading now, Parshat uh, Vayetze this week and Vayishlach next week, and that is that Yaakov Avinu, uh, alone amongst the Avos, uh, erects matzevot, pillars of stone. He puts up four of these in the course of his career. Uh, what's behind that? What do they symbolize? How do they hold together? Why didn't any of the other Avot do this? So getting into deep down, what are the Matzevot? Mm -hmm. And this will give a really good sense, I think, of the beautiful, beautiful achievements of the literary readings of Torah, of, 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 of seeing how word plays hold together uh, that are really, really just, just beautiful. Shabbat afternoon, 
we're going to be focusing a little bit on the issues that we've been discussing here in our, our uh, discussion here this morning, and that is uh, laws in the Torah that seem to contradict one another. Uh, we're going to take a look at one such law, and it really seems when you read just the straight, simple meaning of the psukim in two different places that the law that we're looking at is just irreconcilable. And that'll be Beivrit. Yeah, this will be the Shir Beivrit, and I'm so impressed that there's a Kahila in, uh, in Chutz Laaretz that is a Shir Beivrit, and it's not just for Israelis, but for mm. also for English speakers who want to keep up their Hebrew. So I'm happy to oblige on that. And this will really show us a really wonderful example of how our modern assumptions about things as simple as law uh, turn out to be anachronistic. And we need to kind of peel away what do we come to the table with that is just like is natural to us, the air we breathe, it turns out that wasn't the case back then. Once we've cleared away the snow, then we can see the beautiful ground that's underneath. That's going to be the sheer Be'ivrit, uh, before Mincha. Uh, and then Motzei Shabbat, uh, we're going to be discussing the uh, historical accuracy of the, the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, of the Exodus. Uh, what are some of the claims that people make out there? Why is it that many claim that, that the story cannot possibly be factually true? Uh, we're going to look at some evidence, some very interesting relationships between uh, what we have in our Torah and Egyptian texts uh, uh, that are really fascinating. Really well, fascinating. And Sudash Lishit, are you speaking as well? Yeah, yeah. Sudash Lishit, my thought was to talk, you know, our, our, our community and recent years uh, has been rocked by a series of uh, unfortunate incidents where leaders in whom many had placed uh, their trust and uh, looked to with great with great esteem. Um, it turned out those leaders have in their personal conduct uh, far less than what we might have hoped and kind of a crisis of confidence. Uh, is it even healthy that we put people up on a pedestal, that we give cover to individuals uh, in this way? Uh, I have found that in talking with non, non-religious Jews, the most difficult thing it is for me to describe is the way in which we put Rav Lichtenstein on a pedestal. The, cult, the whole notion of kvot harav, people get the heebie-jeebies yeah. about that. And I want to talk about that and why I think it's so important for us to give great kavod and in spite of the dangers. And really to understand more deeply what it is it that we're doing when we hold someone up and say, ah, oh, he is. So that's going to be our talk at Sudash Lishit. Fantastic. Okay. Well, Rabbi Dr. Joshua Berman, I want to thank you, first okay. of all, for schlepping to Toronto during our first snow, okay. and uh, especially for all the work that you're doing. We're very much looking forward to your talks over Shabbos. We invite you to join us if uh, you're on Facebook to uh, check us out at the Bayit over Shabbat or Motzei Shabbat, and wishing everyone a good Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Thank you.